One of the themes in my thinking about human nature has always been evolution. If you imagine that human children learn language because they are innately uh, prepared for the task, it just raises the next question, well, how do they get that way? And that takes you to evolution. More generally, in any biological uh, question, evolution always has to be part of the answer. The great evolutionary biologist Theodosius Dobzhansky famously said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Why? Well, evolution answers two questions. One of them is, how did it get that way? And the other is, why does it work the way, with the way it does? When we come across some complex biological system, whether it's anatomical or, or psychological, we always want to know why it is the way it is. Not just how does it work, but why does it work that way? It was part of the great computational neuroscientist David Mars program for studying uh, the mind and the brain. He said it's never enough to just specify the algorithm that the brain uh, uses. You always have to know the, the problem that it's solving, the computation that it is designed to get you the answer to. And this is a, a kind of question that we ask as curious people whenever we come across something uh, complex. Uh, an example is this little gadget that I found lying around the set. Uh, clearly, it's got a, a complex structure. It's got uh, this lattice of uh, screen work and a, a rim. It's, it's round. It's obviously not for keeping the, the bugs out. And I asked the camera crew, um, what is it for? What is it designed to do? Well, what I learned is it's, a, it's called a scrim. And it, you can put it in front of a spotlight, and it dims the spotlight without changing the color of the spotlight. That's what the uh, screen does. Now, once we have the answer to the question, what is it for? What was it designed to do? Now, it, uh, everything makes sense. I understand why there's a scorch mark. I understand uh, why it's round as opposed to uh, rectangular. This is a kind of reverse engineering, figuring out what something was uh, engineered to do. And when we do biology, we do a kind of reverse engineering. Why does the heart have valves? Why do we have a spleen? What are the kidneys for? Where the answer is not there was an engineer who wanted it to do something. Of course, unless you are a creationist, in which case the answer is God. But uh, if you're a scientist, you are apt instead to point to natural selection the only physical process that we know of that's capable of generating the illusion of design or signs of engineering in the natural world. Now, that's true of uh, eyeballs and kidneys and hearts, but it's also true of our learning abilities and our memory systems and our emotions. Namely, we can ask, uh, what were they designed to do? In some cases, the answer is, is pretty obvious. Why do we have stereoscopic 3D vision? Well, so we don't fall off cliffs and, uh, and bump into things. In some cases, it's somewhat obvious, but still has some interesting things to teach us. Why do we have fear, uh, that emotion? Well, it keeps us out of danger. Things we tend to fear are the things that could kill us, like heights and predatory animals and storms. A little clue that evolution really is the answer to why the emotion of fear is installed in us, is that many of our fears are anachronistic. We actually kind of fear the wrong things. What we really should fear is uh, texting while driving. That kills people, but no one has a fear of that, presumably because our ancestors did not drive and text for uh, hundreds of thousands of years in which the people without that fear would survive. What we do fear are snakes and spiders and heights and blood, the kind of things that were threats for the long period of time in which our ancestors did evolve. This is a question that you can ask of any psychological faculty, and I have. Why do we have angry facial expressions? Darwin tried to answer that question. I don't think his answer was uh, particularly good. But with Ian Reid and Peter DeSholey, two uh, postdocs, we did a study that showed that angry facial expressions are ways of making our threats more credible. Anyone can issue a threat, uh, but how do you know it's not a bluff? When the threat is accompanied by an angry facial expression, it's more likely to show that we mean business. And we even did an experiment to show it using a, a little uh, a game called the ultimatum game, where there is a sum of money given to a proposer. He can split it with an acceptor in any proportion that he wants. The acceptor can either accept the share 
or scuttle the deal, in which case neither side gets anything. Uh, now, if you were really a rational actor, just calculating the advantage, uh, then the proposer should split it 99 to 1. That way he gets as much as possible. Hate to interrupt. Wouldn't you prefer uninterrupted indulgence? Head to findqualia.com to access the entire series by the genius Steven Pinker, completely ad-free. The proposal should think, well, a hundredth of a loaf is better than none, and, and um, if scuttling the deal would be kind of to cut off his nose to spite his face. He'd, he'd end up with nothing. Neither of them would end up with nothing. But needless to say, that's not the way people tend to uh, work. And typically, when you play out the ultimatum game in real life, the acceptor is insulted if it's too far from 50-50. Uh, and anticipating it, the proposal tends to make 50-50 offers, kind of knowing that anything less will get the offer rejected to the loss of both of them. It's a kind of threat on the part of the acceptor not to accept a fair deal. And so uh, we had people play a version of the ultimatum game in which we showed them a video of the acceptor. Actually, it was a, an actor in our case. There was no real acceptor. Where the acceptor said, if you give me uh, anything less than 70%, I'm going to kill the deal and we'll both get nothing. What we varied was half the time the actor delivered that threat with an angry expression. Half the time they gave it with a neutral expression. And what we found was with the angry expression, more proposals knuckled under the threat and gave them the, uh, the 70%. So that's an example of how you can test a hypothesis about the evolutionary function of something that might otherwise seem uh, inexplicable. Uh, I've argued that language is clearly a Darwinian adaptation. This is a way in which I uh, depart from the famous linguist Noam Chomsky, who was the first to propose that language is an innate capability of the human mind, but uh, to the puzzlement of a lot of people, denied that it is an adaptation for communication. Thought that it just arose from uh, the way the brain is put together, perhaps as the result of a lucky mutation. The psychologist Paul Bloom argued that language seems to show signs of an adaptation, like anger, like fear, like uh, the organs of the body, like, uh, like the scrim. Uh, too many parts seem to be contrived to bring about some useful outcome for it to be the result of chance. In the case of language, the obvious outcome is sharing information. Indeed, following a suggestion by John Tooby, I've suggested that language was one of three adaptations that co-evolved that makes humans so unusual in the animal kingdom. The other two are technological know-how. We make tools, we make uh, baby slings, uh, detoxify plants, we extract poisons, we use our brain power to outsmart other plants and animals. And the third thing that makes us kind of weird as far as animals are concerned is our sociality, our social relationships. A lot of animals cooperate with their genetic relatives for familiar uh, evolutionary reasons, but it's kind of rare to, see, to find animals that are not related cooperating, and humans do that massively. I think those three um, adaptations uh, co-evolved, each one multiplying the benefits of the other two. Again, I'm following a suggestion by John Tooby and Lita Cosmides and Urban DeVore. If you've got information to share because you're smart and you figure things out, well, that's an awfully tempting thing to offer someone that you want to have a relationship with. You have something that helps them and you can, in fact, share it at no loss to yourself if you have language, so it makes language very useful. It also gives us a reason to uh, cooperate as social partners. Each of us can help the other uh, thanks to information that we can share and thanks to the means to share it, namely language. So the cognitive niche, as uh, Cosmetes and Tubi and DeVore called it, uh, namely the co-evolved harmonious interaction between language, sociality, and know-how, each fostered the other, turning us into this very weird primate. Now, crucially, the fact that a lot of things seem to be adaptations, fear and anger and language, disgust may be another one. It may be our defense against uh, pathogens where we uh, have a resistance to the possible vectors of disease like bodily secretions and uh, uh, vermin. doesn't mean that everything is an adaptation. 
that would be kind of circular. Anyone can think up some function of uh, whatever trait you come across. And I'm actually skeptical that some things that many people just assume are adaptations really were selected by Darwin's process of selection in the sense that they helped our ancestors have more babies. It's not clear that the content of dreams has any adaptive function other than keeping the brain active when, when you sleep. Dreams, for all we know, might be a kind of uh, screensaver where what you dream may not have any particular advantage. Controversially, I have not seen an argument that uh, music is, a, is an adaptation. Now, of course, it's adaptive in the sense that it makes life worth living and it's something that we enjoy together, but why sounds in rhythmic and harmonic relationships should give us pleasure, I don't think anyone has ever come up with a reason why that would increase our survival that, that wasn't circular. It's a question that you have to pose for every psychological trait, every physical trait. The answer might be that it is Dar Darwinian natural selection, but it might be a byproduct of something else. In the case of music, it may be a byproduct of our auditory scene analysis, the pleasure that the brain takes in making sense of the world. It may be a byproduct of language, the fact that uh, we communicate through sound. It may be a byproduct of motor control, being able to keep a rhythm, a steady groove, which is useful in running and repetitive actions. It may be a combination of all of them. It may be the fact that the brain itself runs on rhythmic activity and something about music engages with the rhythms of the brain. We have to be prepared for uh, all of these possibilities. Maybe music is an adaptation. I have not yet heard a good explanation of how it might be. The alternative is that as a byproduct, it might come about uh, as we combine all of these byproducts in one big enjoyable package. Because one thing that you can't deny about music is People enjoy it. It's one of our greatest sources of pleasure. One of the things that having a big brain allows you to do is figure out how to give yourself pleasure, how to tickle your own pleasure centers. And it could be that with a brain that for a number of reasons makes certain sounds uh, pleasurable, to make sense of the world, to keep in rhythm, we have uh, confected music as a kind of a delicious experience, a kind of uh, cheesecake where we pack in lots of pleasure delivering stimuli. It's not that cheesecake is something we ever evolved a specific taste for. We evolved a taste for sweets, for fats, and we're smart enough to combine them into one really enjoyable package. Music, for all we know, may be a kind of uh, pleasure technology, a product that we uh, concoct precisely for our own enjoyment.